Okay, I think I'll get us started. Hello everyone again and welcome. My name is Elena Walczak and I'm the president and CEO of Calm and I'm really happy to be here with you today serving as moderator, facilitating a conversation with my amazingly talented colleagues uh, to discuss a topic that we work on every single day here at Calm, mental health and childhood trauma issues. And as many of you know, April is National Child Abuse Prevention Month. So throughout this month, we've been sharing knowledge and trying to raise awareness through events and opportunities like these. The title of today's session is Meeting the Moment for Mental Health. And as you all know, we've all collectively gone through an extended period of uncertainty and anxiety, truly a collective trauma. And we're living through a global health pandemic, tremendous economic turmoil, political upheaval, and the public health crisis of racial violence and continued systemic racism. So many are talking at this point about the fourth wave of the pandemic being intensifying mental health needs facing our communities. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Calm has been on the front lines of this time, addressing the mental health needs of our community head on. Our staff, have been and continue to be essential workers, nimbly meeting the changing and growing needs of the most vulnerable among us. So today I have the pleasure of being in dialogue with Calm's clinical leadership team to gain their firsthand experiences from this past year, to really hear from them what they've learned, uh, what they're seeing now with respect to clinical trends and current mental health needs, and what we are all anticipating the future will bring. So this session, for those of you that have joined us in the past, it's going to be a little bit different than previous sessions in that rather than individual presentations, I will be facilitating a, a panel discussion for the first half, then we'll transition to a Q&A for the second half. So I really hope uh, that those of you in the audience today will ask questions. There's the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can type in questions. I will be able to see those and can pose those to the panelists later in the session. I'll try to get to every question. If for any reason we run out of time, we will make sure to follow up after and respond to your question via email. So without further ado, I think I'll go ahead and uh, introduce my esteemed panelists. So first is Adolfo Garcia. He's our Director of Clinical Operations, a licensed marriage and family therapist who oversees all of Calms Countywide Mental Health Services. He has his master's degree in clinical psychology from Antioch University, has been with Calms since 2004. So 17 tremendous years of service. Um, and has excelled in all areas as a mental health clinician, a child forensic interviewer, clinical and administrative supervisor, and a program manager. So thanks for being with us, Adolfo. Um, next, we have Gabriela Hansen Lopez, who is our regional manager for South Santa Barbara County, a licensed clinical social worker who earned her master's degree in social work from Columbia University. She's a California native, daughter of immigrant parents with more than 10 years of experience in community mental health. And prior to joining CALM in 2019, she provided comprehensive clinical services for children and families in New York and in California. So welcome, Gabriela. We also have Dr. Rachel Hopsicker, who's our senior manager for continuous quality improvement and doctoral training. Uh, Rachel is a licensed psychologist receiving her doctorate from UCSB in 2013. She completed her pre-doctoral internship at the Child Guidance Center of Southern Connecticut and did her postdoctoral training at CALM, and she's remained here ever since. So she oversees our training evaluation um, and really focuses us on CQI here at CALM. So thanks for being here, Rachel. And finally, we have Yvonne Nelson, who is the regional manager for Northern Santa Barbara County. Yvonne is a bilingual bicultural licensed clinical social worker with more than 30 years experience in the social service field. Uh, both her undergraduate and graduate work focused on decolonized social work practice with indigenous and rural populations specializing in trauma work and perinatal mental health. She's been at Calm for seven years and in this role oversees our clinical operations for both Lompoc and Santa Maria Valley. 
So I'm so happy to be here with all of you. And I am so lucky to get to work with you all the time, every day of the week. Uh, but we'll start out our conversation today. Just, I'd love to know how each of you are doing or how you feel our staff is doing after this tremendously difficult year. Well, Elena, it's been a tough year, um, but Calm has adapted and we have had our boots on the ground from the get-go. We never stopped serving clients and we've become first responders and continue to be essential workers in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. I can add that um, we're certainly experiencing our fair share of Zoom fatigue. So this is not just a bu buzzword for us. Um, this is something that's come and gone in waves. Certainly, mm -hmm probably worse and more noticeable at the beginning of the pandemic with the initial transition to telehealth, but our staff have adapted. And of course we continue to experience some ups and downs. So of course by Zoom fatigue, you probably all know what I mean, but just that hyper aroused state due to being around these really zoomed in faces all day long, the increased effort it takes to communicate because we've lost some of our nonverbal communication and gestures. Um, we're just less mobile. We're having more back-to-back -back meetings, less breaks in between, not physically transitioning from sessions or offices. All this just leads to more fatigue and exhaustion. And then, of course, my favorite part of it, um, some researchers out of Stanford calling it mirror anxiety. So it's just mm -hmm. not normal to stare at ourselves all day long in this, in this <laughs> setting. So it leads to negative emotional consequences, unfortunately. Um, but certainly there's been positives to being on Zoom. We're really solidifying our identity as a countywide organization, more opportunities to collaborate with our colleagues across the county and um, probably just more intentional check-ins because we're running into each other less often in the office. And I would just add that with that, our staff are resilient. They're tired, but they're resilient. Um, as Rachel was mentioning, just the constant adjustments that we've had to do on our end to um, like constantly adjust to really find ways of creative ways of how to like engage our families um, in different ways that we've than we've done in the past. And you know, our staff have been really motivated and driven by their work with the clients and and just in general, just the mission that we carry um, countywide. So I'm I'm really just proud of the work that we've all done. They've all done. They're just they're tired. I just, you know, the question of how am I doing, I, I just want to start with saying that this has a, been a, a year that's like a roller coaster. And um, uh, nonetheless, I mean, I am very grateful to work with such an amazing um, group of people, the staff, this leadership team, and, and the collaborations that we have also. They, we couldn't do the work without them. And so uh, it's been really um, great to see some of the outcomes too, that we've been able to see about, you know, 40% more clients and during this time um, as we transition to telehealth and we don't, you know, spend so much time driving and going to places. We've been able to see more clients during that time. And, um, and also the number of services has increased the number, you know, so it, I think it goes in line with, you know, just spending more time in, uh, in direct uh, service delivery uh, with clients and uh, not so much sometimes with, with the, what used to be the drive, right? But uh, uh, additionally, I think that we've seen adjustments in the time, the duration of the service. And that's based on the needs and the, you know, what our families are. Uh, able to do. So um, that's about it. Yeah, and I think I would just say from, you know, where I sit, I just, I'm, I've been so astounded by the creativity and the innovation of all of you, but all of our staff, because no one, I don't think, ever became a therapist to sit on screen with clients and uh, engage in therapeutic work. And so it's been a real shift for everyone in the mental health field um, who knows that there are struggling, vulnerable children and families out there and wanting to connect and being able to connect, but really being creative in order to do so. And that, that has a mental toll to it. It's, it's 
the trauma load, of course, has been very intense, but learning and continuously changing it up to meet the needs, the changing needs has definitely been an intense thing. So, and as you said, Adolfo, I'm just so proud that we, we saw a lot more requests for service and we were able to serve, you know, the numbers that Calm served in the last year were greater than any other year pre-pandemic. So the, I think we're gonna talk next. Um, I'd like to hear from you about what some of the clinical trends have been, but I just want those tuning in to know that the needs have been extraordinarily high and um, our staff are just rock stars in making sure to, to meet the needs of every single client that's been reaching out. So that's been really, a, really a privilege to be a part of that. But tell us, um, those on the call may not know, what are some of the trends that we're seeing during this time? What are some of the clinical issues that our, our clinicians are dealing with right now? I'll just start by you know, saying, I think we hear a lot and we've seen that there's been a decline in the number of uh, suspected child abuse reports that have been made during the last year. And I, I think that goes really in hand with the fact that we've had a lot of, um, uh, you know, staff, like the, the teachers and all the eyes that were put on the kids that would make sometimes those reports, right? They didn't have eyes on the kids this time in the same way. And so there's been an adjustment on that. Um, but additionally, I think as uh, Calm, we have a group of child forensic interviewers who get to interview kids when there's an allegation of abuse. One thing that we've seen within that um, department is uh, as Interviews dropped, the request dropped a little bit, I would say probably about 20%, um, no more than that, but the allegations of abuse seem more severe. And so that's one of the things that we noticed. And, and through that department as well, I think we started noticing a little more allegations of uh, sibling uh, violence, right? So between siblings, um, more allegations on that as well. And I would just add that um, in addition to that, I think we're just seeing an overall prevalence of anxiety and depression. Um, I think when you reflect on just the significant changes that um, within the community just and around the world, just, it's caused a change in the way that we socialize, um, a change in, in the patterns of what's been the norm. And with the, just the, the focus of how uncertain the day-to-day -day might be, um, or just knowing that we no longer have the same connections to, for example, like the schools, uh, there's re been remote learning. So children are not attending um, familiar and safe places as they have in the past, for example, but also just the isolation, um, you know, for adults, for, for children, for various communities. And I think that uncertainty has really just triggered also like um, certain repercussions that, that, um, that we've seen across some of the, the clients that we work with. Um, and interestingly enough, like for teens, we're seeing just like they're, we're paying a close attention to substance use. Um, you know, it's something that we're cautious about, we're paying close attention to, because we know that teens, children, they're susceptible to the stress uh, of the adults around them. And, um, you know, I think also with the, isolation has really come like a change in how um, the teens have been navigating before, like some of the coping strategies they've had that have helped mitigate some of this um, increased stressors. And with the change of being in uh, isolation, like they weren't able to do things like go out with some friends or be able to um, engage in, in different ways um, because of the isolation. And I think all of that just comes into play with um, like in the family system. I'm looking specifically like the challenges that parents have had in co-parenting. We're looking at like the lack of child care and what demands that now placed on family units and changes in like the family dynamics and also the roles uh, because we've had to also adjust in, in various ways. So I think overall we're seeing just like an increase in distress, like an increase in this tension um, and, you know, I think that's something that can be linked to the increased like incidence and maybe severity of the domestic violence. So similar to Elopa, what you mentioned with um, some of the reports of the, of the allegations. So I think that's something we, we see how it's impacted um, various 
people within different systems. Um, so that's what we're seeing across some of our programming. And I would also add, you know, Calm works with a lot of foster families, both children in the foster care system and bio parents who have children in the foster care system. And foster families, you know, did not intend to also, in addition to working with children who have often complex trauma to also be homeschooling them um, while they are experiencing, you know, a variety of stressors, increased depression, in increased anxiety, um, a lot of visits, in-person visits were suspended. So you had children reacting to that. Um, and this put extra, uh, it put extra stress on bio parents, on foster parents. And unfortunately during this time, we saw children losing placement. Um, also as Gabriella and Adolfo have both mentioned this increase in isolation, um, not having access to peers and being stuck in high stress homes led to an increase of re-triggering of PTSD. So children who had completed treatment with us successfully now coming back um, because they're, they're having another episode of their PTSD. Uh, North County, we saw an increase of referrals for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders in postpartum mothers, mothers who are isolated and overwhelmed and now have no access to support. Um, and then I would also say just an increase in uh, a request for parenting support in general and home visitation, which you know our home visitation uh, program is so important because we go and visit, uh, we're able to really provide support services in the home. And that obviously was impacted during COVID. I think just one last thing to share on this, which uh, to me is, is another layer of it. This is how it's impacting our clients, but also uh, thinking about the staff and we're all going through this together, right? So um, the fact when we are start working with a client and sometimes the issues that the clients are dealing with are also issues that are impacting us personally, that are impacting the, the, the staff and the supervisors. That adds another layer that we just have to be so mindful of and careful in how we support each other um, to be able to become more resilient and, and be able to support the community. Yeah, and I think that's really a helpful uh comment Adolfo because I think all of us can resonate with the trauma of this past year it's taken a toll on all of us but those of us who have pre-existing traumas childhood traumas when you add in layers upon layers of trauma the intensity of that for folks and as you were talking about you know the re-triggering of previous traumas and and we saw in this year correct me if I'm wrong but previous clients who are served by CALM, who this time just really intensified their needs. And I was really happy to hear that they were coming back, that they felt trusted and supported by CALM, so they felt comfortable coming back. So we saw a resurgence of returning clients, but that makes a lot of sense, because I know for myself, this was a, you use the word roller coaster, a roller coaster of a year. Um, and if you have pre-existing traumas, um, it's just going to bring back all of those previous experiences and the need for help. So I just want to say that to normalize, if folks are struggling, it's it's really very real. This year has been really quite difficult um, for everyone. So just want to be able to acknowledge that. And uh, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, kind of what we're anticipating next. I mean, a lot has been said of the fourth wave of the pandemic really being this burgeoning mental health crisis. Like we're seeing intensified mental health needs already, but there's going to be a toll for what folks have lived through this past 12, 13, 14 months. And so I know none of us have this magic eight ball or crystal ball to know exactly what's coming, but what are some of the things that you anticipate on the horizon? Yeah, I can jump in. And, and again, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we'll just go over some of our best educated guesses about what we might see. Um, but certainly just uh, grief and traumatic grief from COVID related illness and, and death itself. So what I mean by traumatic grief is um, when someone develops death related trauma symptoms that interfere with the typical ability to grieve or the grief response. Um, 
So obviously leads to more problematic outcomes, but we're already, we're already seeing some of this and some of the kids and families we're serving. Um, we've seen kids who have lost more than one family member, multiple people diagnosed with COVID in the family system, sudden death, unfortunately, inability to visit or say goodbye to loved ones. And then of course, um, the inability to come together to grieve in the traditional ways that, that we normally would due to ongoing restrictions. So we anticipate, unfortunately, that will probably continue. Um, there's also uncertainty about the long-term effects of COVID in general. So there's a study out this month that suggests that about one in eight people um, who've been infected with COVID will go on to develop first-time anxiety and mood disorders. So that being said, we just have a lot more to learn about the long-term consequences of COVID, kids, adults, and, and how that impacts the family system. And lastly, there certainly have been some, some kids and individuals who've benefited over the past year from social isolation and avoiding things that might have otherwise um, created anxiety symptoms for them. So, you know, kids that we serve with social anxiety, generalized anxiety, separation anxiety, that kind of thing. These kids and, and these people are now having to re-enter their lives, <laughs> the world, going back to school. So we're expecting more needs just based on this rather sudden reintegration and exposure to anxiety producing scenarios. Um, and related to that, I anticipate we'll probably just see a bit more specific phobia in younger kids, teens, kind of across the board, just because of what COVID has kind of done in terms of thinking the world might not be as safe of a place as we thought it would, and other people might not be as safe as we thought they were. Rachel, as you mentioned that I, for what I see in terms of um, like this younger children, like I'm thinking about the preschool age children, they're, um, uh, developmental delays, like just in the trajectory of like just um, what they're experiencing, there have been gaps um, in the social emotional like skill development for, you know, I'm thinking three to five year olds, they just, uh, they've missed a year plus um, of opportunities to engage in like um, natural or just um, in different settings like social interactions. This is where they naturally learn um, how to expand on their negotiation skills, on their um, ability to communicate uh, a little bit differently. So I think this is gonna be a pretty significant shift in how um, these gaps may show up in the next you know, year, two, three uh, moving forward because it's such an important part of their development. Um, so I, I'm anticipating seeing some of those gaps. Um, and I think just in general, like also just being mindful of, you know, when we were talking earlier about the presentation of anxiety and depression, I think the mild presentation of that has just been um, just increased in terms of how we're, um, what we're seeing. And then, you know, just being very mindful of how that can move into more severe, uh, may, maybe major depression, or just like overall how that's going to impact the mental health spaces and environments. Um, so I think we want to just be very mindful of what that may look like moving forward. Yeah, and I think another component is that COVID has really had a systemic impact. It's had an impact on our economy. Um, and we have no idea, like we, we're just beginning to the beginning of that. And certainly our clients more than any are, are not immune to the impact of financial instability. They have been impacted and we anticipate they will continue to be impacted. Um, and as my colleagues have referenced, COVID sort of was a, it's a, been a collective trauma. You know, we've all experienced it. And so folks who previously, you know, might've had bad days are now having full blown mental health system um, symptoms. And this has, has taxed our mental health system. Um, and that we believe that the healthcare system will have to be revolutionized, but we don't know what that's gonna look like. So CALM will have to adapt during, un, you know, amongst uncharted waters. Um, and, and I do wanna say, you know, as I listen to all of this, it has been a traumatic year. Um, 
and we've been changed and we expect that. But we've also seen an incredible amount of resilience. Um, our staff have adapted, our clients have adapted, our community has come together. Um, and these are lessons that I think we're gonna take with us into the future. Thank you for that. And I really appreciated your comments about, you know, the changing systems in which we work, because I don't, I don't think it's that we just plow through the pandemic, take a deep breath, re-enter society, and we just keep doing business as usual. I think that the education system is forever changed, healthcare system is forever changed, and, and mental health service provision is, is probably forever changed. I'm seeing a few specific questions that have come into the Q&A, which we'll get to in a second about, about some of those changes. But thinking about those systemic changes and just you know, all that we've carried uh, over the last year, can you share with the audience a little bit about what Calm is doing now to prepare for this shifted reality and what we're doing now and we're gonna continue to do in the months ahead to just make sure we're ready for these growing needs? I can start sharing about that. I think, you know, one of the things that we've learned through this pandemic is we had to move really quickly. I talk about shift. We had to shift all the service, services that we were delivering to be delivering out via telehealth. And I don't think there is one therapist that was trained to provide services via telehealth, you know, um, 24 seven, well, not 24 seven, but all the time. Uh, of their work hours. Um, and the, the piece I think that for us is was super important is to be able to provide the tools and continue to, we continue to look for resources that we can um, share with the staff and trainings to help them be able to provide the same level of quality of service that was being provided in person now via also telehealth. But additionally, I think there is a big um, right now focus for us uh, um, to look at the modalities that we're using and how we're addressing the needs of the community. And, you know, really looking at modalities that are trauma informed and also uh, culturally sensitive and responsive. So I think that's a, a huge focus for us uh, moving forward to, to address, um, to provide those tools to our staff and be able to address the needs. Another way I think that we're preparing is that Calm has and is actively participating in a number of community collaborations with the Department of Social Services, with public health, with behavioral wellness, with family service agency. We are looking and discussing actively at identifying gaps of service and really um, trying to adapt so that we can really meet the needs of our community in the midst of this pandemic now and in the future. And that's very exciting. And Yvonne, as you mentioned that, uh, you know, it's the expansion of those col um, community collaborations because we're looking at the adults, right? The adults who are working with children, either it's the teachers or a parent, there's a lot of adults uh, that are present and create the environment for, for their children or their students. And we, we also are pretty clear that if an adult is stressed or is experiencing um, negative impacts of, of the stress, it has a direct impact on the children around them. It has a direct impact on the environment that they're a part of. So we, we wanna make sure that we're also tending to the adults, um, creating like a, a, new, a new norm. Um, there's been so many adjustments, but how do we create like a new norm that's also safe, safe and stable? And that's ultimately going to help mitigate some of the challenges that they may be seeing for, for the children around them. And I think it really will help to increase not only the capacity of the adult to be able to, to address whatever's coming their way, but I think it ultimately just lends itself to really support the children in terms of expanding like their social, emotional capacity as well. So it's really like also a big emphasis that we are looking to provide that um, broader touch, that universal approach, um, because we, we want to be mindful of the people that create the, these environments and these environments of support for, for children um, moving forward. Yeah, and I can add that I think a, a huge thing that we're doing to prepare is just really um, making sure our staff are feeling strong and resilient and doing everything we can to try to 
um, protect staff against burnout and secondary traumatic stress. Um, so we've been doing a number of things to address this throughout the whole year and, and certainly recently as well. Um, we're really trying to invest in our relationships and, and fostering positive connections across staff. So taking time for team building activities, making sure we're communicating as an, uh, an agency-wide um, organization, building, building relationships, um, having teams spend more time together. Um, we have a weekly all staff Zoom call that's been super, super important and healing, I think. Um, and then of course, just really high quality, consistent clinical supervision and regular consultation um, is so protective against burnout and secondary traumatic stress. Um, we have an amazing wellness committee <laughs> at Calm and, and we're doing great things like weekly yoga classes, twice a week uh, stretch break class, focusing on nutrition and sharing recipes, things like that. Just, just trying to make wellness fun and interactive. And then um, what we know from research is that um, something that's really protective against a burnout is being able to connect to our sense of purpose and meaning. So why we chose to get, go into this work um, why I chose to come to work at Calm. So spending time reflecting on that is super, super important and protective. And we've been doing that during our all staff um, Zoom meetings. We are taking time to reflect together on Calm's mission, Calm's values, and um, trying to buffer ourselves that way for what, what might come. I'm so proud to work at Calm. <laughs> just listening. I mean, we are doing all of those things and we've co-created it and it's um, what a godsend to each of us, right? Personally and professionally to have such a supportive uh, environment and um, team oriented atmosphere. Because when we were dealing with such times of isolation to still have this broader purpose, like to, to, to know that we were doing something bigger than ourselves, really, I think it helped me and helped all of us. And Rachel, you are uh, intuitive because you just proactively answered one of the first uh, questions that we received in the Q&A function. So I'll just use this as a, as a time to, to shout out for those watching at home. Please use the Q&A button to uh, pose questions, but there was a question specifically about how are we taking care of staff? So I think you already, you already covered that, but that's been something um, really important for us at Calm that we always take seriously, this notion of secondary trauma and compassion fatigue. When we're hearing stories of trauma, you know, the hearers of those stories, it, it integrates into, into their being. And so we have to proactively attend to that and really promote resilience. And as Adolfo, you said earlier, this trauma was unique in that it affected all of us in some way. Um, you know, clinicians at Calm were also juggling homeschool. They were also dealing with the illness of people in their family, the death of loved ones. They don't know which clients might show up on their caseload that have a very similar issue as they. And they had to just keep working through that. And so the layers of secondary trauma in the last year we're really unlike some, I mean, secondary trauma is secondary trauma, but it was very much intensified this past year. Um, and I just also, also want to say that we at Calm, in addition to our clients, the individual kids and families, we think of the community as a client. It's very important to us that we're pushing out resiliency to our community partners. We can't do this alone. You were talking about the systemic nature of this work, Gabriela, and so and the adults that work with children, you know, the children are always our North Star, but we have to work with teachers. We have to work with our colleagues at CWS. We have to work with preschool providers and make sure that they're whole. Because if they're not whole, how are, any, how are we gonna support our families in this community? So we've taken that really, really seriously this past year. Opportunities like this, just to engage community members is something that we believe in deeply. So. Another question that came in, so I'm, I'm now formally pivoting to the Q&A section of our, of our time. So anyone in the audience, please, please type in some questions. 
But there was a question specifically about telehealth. Um, I get in a two part question, if any of you can comment on kind of the pros and cons, what gets lost via telehealth, but maybe also what gets gained by using telehealth, as well as are you imagining that telehealth is part of the future for the mental health industry? So any of you want to answer that? I can, I can start and please anyone else can jump in to, if I'm forgetting something, but this has been a really interesting, I mean, I love this question because um, I never thought we would be using Zoom and it's been really telling in terms of the, the benefits of it. There's the challenge as I think Rachel shared earlier, we spent a lot of time in front of the computer in front of you know looking at yourself and all that. But at the same time, it was really great that within one week of transitioning, like I saw a spike on the number of uh, services provided because our uh, staff were communicating with the clients this is the shift we're going through. How can we support you? Um, what is the schedule that works for you? We had this duration before. Now we're we're shifting that, right? And um, and I think there were some families that had a harder time with uh, with telehealth. Not necessarily those already receiving services, but those that were requesting services. And suddenly was like, wait, you're asking that we're going to do this via telehealth? Like, uh, not really open to it. But the, as they tried it then we saw more acceptance on like, okay, this is what it is. And actually also gratitude for the fact that we could provide that service in that way. Uh, as we've, you know, this, this pandemic, we've gone through so many different cycles of we, we're moving into staying home, providing services, then there's an, a different level of, we're going to focus on the needs of the families. And if someone is clinically indicated that is not the best form to use telehealth, then we were looking at how can we provide then some in-person service, right? And, and that's continued to shift. And we're looking forward to the, you know, the complete transition into uh, in-person services are again, the primary way in which we will deliver a service, yet we've learned that through telehealth, we've been able to reach a lot of families. So if now I think at some point, um, I, I think the question, if telehealth is moving away, I don't think it's going away. There's There have been great gifts on this. And I mean, just one, we're here in this meeting and we can share, right, without necessarily having to go somewhere and all that, it, it's amazing. The, the level of um, uh, productivity that's come up as well with this, right? For 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 management and as well in leadership. So, I would just add one more thing, just because I think it's been like a pretty remarkable response. Is that we've been able to offer some of our services, like such as like the parenting classes, um, that has been able to um, service families or parents um, countywide. And you know, no one had to commute or make arrangements or anything like that. And it's been incredible just to see how far of a reach we've been able to just um, make our service available, um, it, specifically in like the parenting education um, delivery of it. So that's been a really wonderful, um, like I look for, like you mentioned, I think it's, it's been a gift that we have an opportunity to engage in, in that kind of way. One thing that I'd be very curious, we have not taken a look at this yet, but just to see what is the rate of cancellation and no show via telehealth versus what it was before, right? And so I, I'm really looking forward to um, diving into that and then exploring what, what's happened on that. But I, I think it would be very telling as we get more numbers on that. Yeah, I would just add, I think it's wonderful that we've been able to adapt um, and I think in the future, there will be some clients that might be better served, especially, you know, our mothers who have, you know, a variety of children under five. Um, and also we serve, we serve a lot of children and teenagers who have complex trauma and the work that we do, it's really important that we're able to do it in person because we want to make sure that we are attuning to uh, traumatic responses to folks becoming uh, dysregulated and we want to be, make sure that we can do that in real time. So luckily at Calm, we've been able to adapt. We've been able to um, reduce barriers for folks who couldn't make it into the office, but actually go out into the field and have some in-person services when it was, when it was safe.
And I'm really thankful that we've been able to be that flexible. Rookie mistake, forgot to unmute. I was gonna say that um, I think Zoom has really, has really the adaptability that all of our clinicians have shown that they're, um, you know, I think at the very beginning of this, you know, we were knee deep and pivoting to telehealth. I mean, back gosh, do you remember <laughs> last March when you all did that in three days and we had to figure it all out and we weren't sure that we'd be able to connect with anyone across that platform. I think our biggest fears were around the littlest of the littles, the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds. And what I have just been amazed by over this year, we have such gifted people who just dove in and found creative ways and were able to do sand tray therapy on a digital sand tray over the screen and where, you know, and, and children who were not talking to their therapist for months because of anxiety issues, being able to do a Zoom session with their therapist from their bedroom and show their therapist their stuffed animals and their drawings. Like we never could have anticipated some of those positive outcomes. Um, I think the flip side, you know, as a mom of two 10 year olds who have been in virtual school and are still not back five days a week yet, they're still two days. Um, how is this, you know, and I think we're gonna have to see what research shows, but how is all of this digital focus going to impact children? How is, you know, obviously screen time was here before the pandemic, but there were many households, my, mine included, where we didn't use screen time. Like it was there and we would do family movie night, but I, my kids didn't have tablets. They weren't using screens, but I can't, I can't say no anymore. It's part of their life. So we're gonna have to watch the research on how all of this screen time really influences brain development and social interactions. And I think whether we like it or not, we're living through a research experiment right now to some extent of how this, this digital focus is going to influence um, children's development and parenting, parent-child relationships because it's, some of that has shifted. Um, I, another question came through about how we um, supported families if they didn't have reliable access to technology. So I know there was a lot of effort, especially in the beginning. So can you talk about some of those strategies we used? I will just jump in. Um, we've been very fortunate enough to be able to triage those cases and work with the families. So we've had quite a few clinicians get really creative in terms of like um, being able to provide that support in person, um, masks, so you know, socially distance, uh, following like the um, policies protocols around safety because we wanted to ensure the safety of the clients as well as our staff. And um, whether that was outdoor visits, as long as they can ensure it was like a confidential space, um, you know, making use of like what we have available, the beach, the parks. Um, I think really we wanted to make sure that we were meeting the needs of our clients, whether that was in telehealth or in person. We really prioritize the client's need. That's always like you mentioned earlier, it's like our North Star. What's going to be in the best interest of this child? And how do we how do we do that? And so we've had the flexibility to engage in a hybrid model from the very beginning. And again, it was really focused on the client and what's going to be in the best interest and how do we support that? Yeah, we also up in Santa Maria in particular, we had a lot of families that just didn't have, you know, migrant farm workers that didn't have access to internet. And so we did phone sessions. And what we did was we did a couple phone sessions a week because you know it's hard to do one hour of session on a phone, but we, we accommodated um, to really make sure that we were providing that support. And initially our services uh, shifted to stabilizing. And then once the, they got comfortable in the medium, then we were able to move more towards processing and dealing with symptoms. Uh, 
it wasn't easy, um, which is why it's so wonderful that our state potentially is opening up again and we can see some of these folks in person. But we definitely, like Gabriella said, the need of the client was at the forefront and we adapted and met those needs any way we could. And I remember at the very beginning of the pandemic when you know, Zoom was new, you know, and it's not new anymore, sadly. We all, we all know Zoom. Um, but in the beginning when it was new, I know we were using phone and Zoom, HIPAA compliant telehealth in shorter durations. So folks weren't yet ready to do an hour long on Zoom. That was like unheard of. And so we were doing 20 minute sessions and 30 minute sessions. And as you're saying, we just met the clients where they were and what they needed. And sometimes we were doing 20, 30 minute sessions, but doing them three times a week, because especially in the very beginning, people were really needing those anchors because the world shifted so quickly. And for many of our clients, that was so disorienting and dysregulating that they needed that support. I think now as, as screen time and Zoom has become more normalized, more clients are, are back to more traditional 50 minute, 60 minute sessions. But I'd also share with the audience at home that, you know, because Calm is uh, a part of the essential workforce, we have also offered in-person services, you know, since last summer, we have, we have been primarily telehealth just to promote safety of our staff and most importantly, the clients, but we have, we never stopped really providing in-person services right. since last June. So we see families in our, in our offices, we see families in their backyards, we see families out in the community wherever they feel safe and private. So we have really, if technology wasn't a possibility, we met people in person wherever they felt comfortable and we were always authorized and able to do that. Um, I'll ask a, a just, Another question um, as we start to, to wrap up, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the difficulties of this year for all of us, really, for our clients, for our staff, um, for everyone listening. Um, and we pride ourselves on being trauma experts at Calm, but I know each of us really believes that we have a very important role in building resiliency. Um, resiliency is what gets us through trauma. So what are each of you most hopeful about? Where do you see resiliency coming as we move forward? Uh, what comes to mind for me is, I think uh, areas we've already probably touched on, but but I'm I'm just incredibly, hopeful in knowing that the community and our clients trust Calm and believe in us as an organization. So as we've mentioned, previous clients of ours have returned to us um, when they need a booster, they need additional support, they're being re-traumatized. And that just, that says it all really. So I find hope and comfort in that, just our clients in the community knowing we're here and that we're not going anywhere. Um, also something we've mentioned, but just we've learned a lot about our ability to innovate. And, um, you know, we had no idea this was coming and we just, we, we met the moment. Um, so I, I just know Calm continues to meet the moment. We meet our clients, we meet the community where they're at. Um, and, and I think now as, a, as an organization, we just, like really, really know this and feel this and trust this. We know our strength, we know our resilience and we know we can get through anything together. Yeah, I would also, for me personally, I just feel really proud to work at an agency that's so community minded. I feel like uh, COVID really brought us together as a community with community partners. And we, I mean, we all adapted and we reached across sectors we borrowed resources from each other um, and we adapted and continued to adapt and looked as, an, as, as partners, as community, what, where, where we, things needed to be fortified and we came together. Our leaders came together, our, our CEOs came together, our frontline staff and community members in general. And, uh, and I think that that is something that we're gonna take into the future. I think we've learned as community-based organizations 
that we can't do this alone. And I, that is very exciting to me as a provider. Yeah, and I, I think I'll ask you perhaps one final question unless a few more come in, but you know, as first responders um, who have been knee deep in this crisis over the last year, uh, what are each of you doing to stay whole and healthy? Like, do you have any tips? I mean, all of us, I think, have heard that we have to take care of ourselves if we, especially those of us who are parents, um, you know, kids look to us. So we have to fill the well up so that we can give to others. And I think anyone that's listening in on this call who works in the social sector, we're all helpers, we're all givers. So we have to replenish ourselves if we wanna be of use to others. But I mean, you guys have to do that like triply so because of, of what we do. So do you have secret, secret wisdom, secret, secret pearls that, you know, those on the call can, can learn from you of, of what you're doing? I wouldn't call it a secret unless uh, I haven't shared, but um, I think for me, it's been, I come from a very large family. I have a lot of sisters, nieces, and nephews, and friends. And, and I think when I think about like the formal and informal supports, for me, maintaining that connection. Uh, early on, it started out as a, like Zoom, let's get together as like a Zoom gathering. And then that faded pretty quickly. But just having different touch points, whether that was a quick call or like a, a funny text, or I, I think for me personally, was just maintaining those relationships that existed even before or they transitioned. But having that um, consistent connection has been really life giving uh, for me personally. Anyone else want to share things you're doing? I can share. Um, for me, uh, this idea of that true north, uh, my faith is a huge component. I, during this time, I really took inventory of like why I'm here and what's important to me. And that really helped weather the storm. Uh, also, um, as Elena alluded to the, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a boss. And so I really had to take care of myself so that I could, uh, bend and not break in the midst of the strong winds. And, uh, and so I would say that I would say faith, mission and, uh, and flexibility and connectedness. I, this team right here on this call uh, was life-saving. Well, I, I definitely agree with all that's been shared already. And, and I think, I mean, additionally for me, um, one of the things that I try to like just get more into practice is uh, just practicing mindfulness too, that when I am doing something, I really have, you know, intentionally doing it. So if I am uh, connecting with someone that I am paying attention to that person and not just let all the stuff that I have to do or that I haven't done, you know, kind of um, distract me from being present. And um that's been uh, additionally, I think, something that's really helpful to do as we are trying to really have a healthy separation between work and personal life or the connections or, you know, our faith or, you know, all the other things that have been mentioned. Yes, I echo what's been said. The first thing that came to mind was just, yeah, using this, this team here for strength whether it was to you know, process all the changes and everything that's going on, or just to laugh, send a funny text, send some great memes back and forth. I learned a lot about memes this year. <laughs> um, but, but then also just connecting to my spiritual um, practices that keep me grounded. And I also realized I found a lot of comfort in um, strength and becoming more like my grandparents throughout all of this so taking walks around the block after dinner puzzles cooking more sending cards and letters so just some of the little things that have made a difference for me yeah well if it it doesn't if it doesn't come through the screen 
Um, I love this team. Like I'm so deeply grateful for this team. I respect this team and I'm amazed by this team. Um, our community is indebted to you, honestly, for the leadership you've shown. So, um, and I just wanna piggyback on Rachel's comment, laughter. <laughs> I mean, these folks know this, but if I don't laugh every day, and there were some, there were some months back there where I didn't laugh for, weeks and then it really dawned on me that that wasn't okay so laughter has to be a part of my day-to-day -day life um, in order to keep me going uh, especially when we're so isolated you have to find ways to find humor and and really just silly ways to connect with people you care about so <laughs> sadly they all know that I, I find those ways all the time um well again I just truly uh Personally and professionally, I want to thank all of you for the work you do every day, but also sharing yourselves here in this very public <laughs> forum. Um, and I want to thank everyone that tuned in today. Thanks. I know that there's a ton of webinars out there and a lot of learning opportunities, and um, sometimes that doesn't seem so exciting. So I'm, I'm so glad that there's been such a good turnout today and really happy that folks joined us. I hope we provided you information that was meaningful um, and as April comes to a close, when we're really honoring um, efforts to prevent childhood trauma, I just want to thank you all for listening to this and for showing up and for finding whatever the piece is for you that you can shift um, in some way to support children and families. We're just very grateful for you being in this, in this journey with us. Um, I would not be doing my job if I didn't do a shameless plug for Calm. If you want to support us one more time, um, we're doing a virtual fundraiser this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Um, Ladies Get Loud is what it's called, but because it's now virtual, everyone can get loud. So you can go to our website and, and register. Um, that event will support our services throughout the Santa Maria Valley um, and this webinar, sadly for all of us panelists, has been recorded <laughs> um, and will be available on our website forevermore. But so if anyone here, you'll get the link if you're watching and feel free to share this if this was useful. We hope to spread the word to more people. So thank you again. We hope you enjoyed it. Hope you have a great day. Thanks.